I am delighted to introduce our featured speaker, Adina Y. Um, I'll give a little background on Adina. Um, so Adina is originally from the Bay Area and grew up in Oakland. Uh, she attended Chabot College in Hayward, where she obtained an associate's degree in biology. And she obtained a bachelor, master's, and PhD in entomology at the U University of California, Riverside, with a specialization in medical and veterinary entomology, chemical ecology, and aquatic e ecology. Um, she previously worked at the San Joaquin County Mosquito and Vector Control District before coming to Alameda County Vector Control. And she's now the scientific program manager at Alameda County's Vector Control District, overseeing the disease surveillance programs and laboratory projects. Her department provides assistance to all Alameda County residents and helps them with insect, rodent, wildlife, and related issues. Um, Adina is an avid hiker, baker, and cook, along with other hobbies, and she let us know that she's always open to restaurant and market suggestions if you have any. Um, for today, Adina is going to be giving an overview of Alameda County's district services and applying IPM strategies for insects, rodents, and urban wildlife. Uh, she'll also discuss vector, sorry, she'll also could discuss rodent control in homeless encampments and disease surveillance countywide, including hantavirus, Lyme disease, rodent-related diseases, avian and tick-borne pathogens. So I'll pass it right over to you, Adina. Thanks. Thanks, Shoba. Um, yeah, morning, everyone. As Shoba said, I am Adina Y. I'm the Scientific Program Manager for Alameda County Vector Control, so I will just get going. So for those of you who are not familiar or don't quite remember where Alameda County is, so we're directly across the bay from San Francisco, and we um, are one of the two counties that most people think of when they talk about the East Bay um, in the Bay Area. So Contra Costa is to our north. We're bordered um, by San Joaquin County to our east and Santa Clara County to our south. And the mission statement of our district is to prevent the spread of vector-borne diseases, injury, and discomfort to the residents of the district by controlling insects, rodents, and other vectors and eliminating causal environmental conditions through education and integrated pest management practices. So what does that mean in reality? Um, so we are actually a very different vector control district. A lot of what we do, um, we are actually the only ones in the state who do it. Um, it's just kind of worked out that way. So we are tax funded. Um, we are part of the Environmental Health Department. So we are county employees um, and we work in conjunction with the, our other departments underneath the umbrella of our healthcare service agency. So our partner um, departments are like the Department of Public Health. Um, and so we are, like I said, uh, county employees and disaster service workers. And so what that means is that we provide um, services to all residents of Alameda County. So as long as you live within the county, um, you have access to our services and there are no charges for any of our services because we are tax funded um, through a benefit assessment. But what that means is, is that residents can call in if they have issues with insects. Oh, okay. you're unmuted again, okay. I touched nothing, so. <laughs> Yay teams. All right. So um, yeah, so what that means is that um, if, in, if residents of the county have like fleas or ticks, lice, mites, um, bed bugs, flies, cockroaches, they can call us. Um, over half of what our district deals with actually are, is rodent calls from the public. So um, we deal with a tremendous amount of rat calls um, and mice calls in the county. And so our biologists go out there and do inspections. Um, we also do a tremendous amount of wildlife work. Um, so our biologists are assigned to a specific area of the county. And how it works is that a resident calls in with an issue that they're dealing with, with any of these vectors. And then our biologists go out and actually do an on-site inspection to either the residents or the business um, to make a determination of what the animal actually is. And then um, we go from there. So what does that mean um, in reality for my biologists? Um, let's see. 
So um, in terms of our rodent control, um, we also do, we conduct a sewer baiting program. And so what that means is that our biologists, we have um, actually three staff who do full time two days a week, and they actually do rodent control in the sewer system in the city of Oakland, um, because we have such a big issue with the Norway rat population in the city sewers. So we are actually contracted with the city and we inspect over 8,000 manholes a year. So those are pictures of my colleagues, Ruben, who he is in charge of our sewer baiting program for our district um, and he monitors what manholes need to be checked um, on a yearly basis and then that's actually Wade, uh, my vector ecologist, who is applying a block of rodenticide down into the sewer system. So this is a program that we can we run all year long um, and it's on a yearly basis and we rotate through the manholes um, in the city of Oakland. So that's one of the ways that we help the residents in the city deal with their rat issues. Um, as I mentioned, um, our biologists also deal with a lot of urban wildlife. So what does that mean? Um, mainly we focus on um, raccoon, skunk, and opossum issues. So if you end up having a raccoon that breaks into your attic space, is having babies, whatnot, um, you can call us and our biologists will go out. Um, and then we work with the homeowner primarily through educational um, matters and talking through to the homeowner what needs to be done, um, and then also helping to get that animal to move out on its own. Um, we do not try to trap the animal out. That's our last resort. Um, we try to get the animals to move out of their own accord, and especially at this time of year because it's baby season. So we've got baby skunks running, um, baby raccoons are gonna start, and opossums are kind of pregnant all year long. Um, so we've got baby critters running. So our, it is not our first resort to trap the animals out of the county. And we explain to residents and we educate them that they were here first, that they're an integral part of our environment. And so we try to work with the homeowners and educate them on how to live with these animals and how to prevent them from getting into their homes. Um, but if we have to, we do have the ability to trap those animals out. Um, and if we do, then we have to euthanize them by um, California Fish and Wildlife Code. So how do you get a raccoon um, to move out of your house <laughs> or another animal that happens to get in? So some of the things that our biologists do um, is apply things like one-way doors. So as the name implies, how this works is that the animal has the ability to come out but does not have the ability to re-enter the structure. Um, and our biologists will work with the homeowner or the business in order to basically put these on the structure um, and then educational purposes and other repair work of what needs to be done in order to get these animals to go out of their own accord. So um, the picture at the end there is actually of some squirrels that were, um, it's a one-way door slash live trap situation. So that's not actually from our district. That's a picture that I did pull off from online, but it demonstrates what we do. So we get the animals to move out um, and then basically they're they're allowed to go back into the environment at that point. And especially we are implementing and we use these at this time of year, as I mentioned, because it is baby season. So we don't want to remove a mother, especially if she's lactating and she has babies, because then those babies most likely will die or will have to be taken to a rehab center, which is not what we want. So we try to allow mother nature to do her thing um, on her own time frame, and then we work with the homeowner and explain to them how that's going to look, what that's going to look like, um, the time frame it's going to take for that mother animal to move her babies out, and then our biologists work with those homeowners and, and business owners until all those things are resolved. So... Um, the other thing that makes our district very different is the fact that we employ someone on our staff full time who is part of the USDA Wildlife Services. So he is our wildlife trapper, Dave Hammett, and he's awesome, um, as my staff know, and he's been with our district for over 30 years now. So there's not a whole lot that Dave hasn't seen at this point, um, but he is federally permitted to deal with things that most factory control districts and most and our staff would not normally be dealing with. So amazing as it seems, we do actually have enough rural parts of the county left where we have things like feral pigs causing property damage. And that falls under Dave's purview to go deal with. So if we have property damage, a homeowner will call us, Dave will go out and make an assessment and see what can be done to get those pigs off those properties. So he deals with things like foxes and coyotes, turkeys. Um, we don't have a ton of mountain lion stuff in the county, but every once in a while that does happen. Um, deer, anything wildlife related, Dave will go out and then assist the homeowner or business owner with that. 
So the other main part of what our district does um, is disease surveillance and our lab objectives. And so what we do is monitor the abundance and distribution of vectors within Alameda County. And we survey for the presence of vector-borne disease. And then we collaborate with a host of other agencies in terms of research efforts. So we work with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We work with CDFA, um, other cities and stuff, depending on what needs to be done and what the issues are. And we collaborate with all those agencies. So the picture that you see there of our main lab. So um, what can happen is our biologists will bring in samples from the field and then they can go and they can work at our various microscope stations to identify, um, you know, what that issue is, what that insect specimen is that came in from the public. Okay. So um, I'm going to go through all of these diseases more in depth uh, later on in my talk, but one of the main diseases that we do survey for is hantavirus. So we do um, surveillance for deer mice, looking specifically for Sinombre virus. Um, one of our other major programs that we do is to collect, identify, and test uh, fleas using real-time PCR for the presence of fleaborne typhus, which is caused by Rickettsia felis and Rickettsia typhi. Um, we do do, we don't do a whole lot of mosquito work. Um, the way our county is set up is that is mainly the mosquito abatement district that does the mosquito work, but we do do a little bit of it. And then we primarily deal with all the other vectors that I mentioned, but we do do surveillance for West Nile virus, St. Louis encephalitis, Western equine encephalitis, and then right now avian influenza, which I'll talk about later. Um, our other really big program that's going right now, and I've got my staff out all over the county, um, is collecting and identifying ticks for testing for disease pathogens. So we test in-house um, for the causative agents of Lyme disease, so Borrelia burgdorferi, um, as well as other tick-borne pathogens. And then, as I mentioned, um, the residents of the county can call in um, to our biologists if they're having issues with whatever the insect may be. So we deal with medical and veterinary important insects, but the residents also call in because the average homeowner doesn't know the difference between the insects. So we get whatever calls from the public. Um, our biologists will either go out and do an inspection and pick up that specimen, or the homeowner can come to our office and drop that specimen off and then we will ID it for them. And so we have had instances um, because we're also dealing with agricultural pests sometimes where we, one of our biologists got a call and then it ended up being actually a new invasive species to Alameda County. So we sent that aphid off um, to CDFA to be positively identified, re-identified. And then we work with like our ag department um, if any of those issues come up. So that's kind of a main overview of all of kind of the basic stuff that um, our biologists do for the residents of Alameda County. So I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about the disease surveillance that we conduct in the county. So the first program that I'm gonna talk about is our flea worm typhus program. And the reason that this came about and we started looking at it in Alameda County is for those of you who are logging in from SoCal, um, you're probably aware of or might remember is that there it has been an outbreak of flea worm typhus going on in Southern California off and on for the last probably four to five years. So there was an outbreak in Los Angeles County, which actually made the news, um, which some people may remember because there were people getting sick in city hall and they didn't know um, where it was coming from. And what it was determined was that the rats that had fleas on them that were infected with typhus were getting into the building and then the fleas were coming off and then biting the employees working in City Hall. And that's how they were getting sick. So we started thinking about it and wanting to do surveillance for it here in Alameda County because we have all of the same factors um, and cycles going on that they do in Southern California. And there's a historical um, presence of flea worm typhus in Contra Costa County, which borders us to our north. So the flea worm typhus cycle, um, there's actually two different cycles and we have both of them that are most likely occurring in Alameda County. So the first one is the urban cycle, which involves Norway rats and fleas. So normally if humans weren't involved, um, the infected fleas would bite the rats and that cycle would just keep going. So the issue, as I mentioned, which happened in LA County is that the fleas then came off of um, the fleas and then went on to people um, and then caused illness. So the second um, 
submission, or sorry, um, transmission cycle is the suburban cycle, which involves opossums and feral cats. And we have a lot of those, and we deal with that a lot actually in our district. So in that sense, the fleas are then on the opossums and the feral cats as hosts. And then when those animals come into close contact with humans, those fleas then leave um, their hosts and then go on to humans and bite them, transmitting disease. So Rickettsia typhi is the causative agent of murine typhus, or sorry, fleamore typhus um, in humans. And it was first linked, um, a species isolated and linked to human cases of fleaborne rickettsiosis worldwide. And it is linked actually not only to Norway rats, um, but also to roof rats. So it's transmitted by the oriental rat flea, uh, Xenopsilic chiopsis, through, as I mentioned, that cycle of the flea biting the rat and then continuing on. The other pathogen that we're looking at is Rickettsia felis, which is associated with the cat flea pictured here. And it was first recognized as a human pathogen by an outbreak of disease um, in 1991 by a patient in Texas. So um, Synophilus felis, or the cat flea, is the only um, defined biological vector of Rickettsia felis at this point in time. However, um, the oriental rat flea, um, which is the main vector of the other Rickettsia, Rickettsia typhi, has found to also be naturally infected with both pathogens at the same time. So what does that mean for our disease surveillance um, in Alameda County? Well, we're out there looking for fleas that are coming off of the animals that we're trapping. Um, or if we get calls from homeowners where they've got like a flea outbreak, we will call those fleas and then we will bring them back for disease testing. So for cat fleas, for those of you who are not super familiar, um, they're very cosmopolitan fleas. So they are the flea that most people have had experience with if you've ever gotten a flea bite which most people have, um, you know how irritating that can be. And generally it's probably a cat flea. For those of you who have dogs and cats at home, if you've had a flea outbreak, um, even though the name's a little bit of a misnomer, um, cat fleas, they're, everything is a host for a cat flea. There's, there's no animal that basically you will not find a cat flea on. So they're commonly found in homes, under houses and yards where there's dust and organic debris that's accumulating. But as I mentioned, cats are not their main host, actually. They're on cats, dogs, opossums, foxes, coons, rats, you name it. Um, and their bites can cause severe allergic reactions as well as transmitting disease. The other flea that we're uh, interested in looking at and we survey for, along with some other flea species, is the oriental rat flea, and that's Synopsila chiopsis. And the reason that we're so um, interested in looking for this one is because this is historically the chief vector of bubonic plague. So this is the flea that aided in the bubonic plague outbreaks in Europe in the Middle Ages, um, but it is also the vector that transmits flea-borne typhus. Um, and it was introduced worldwide with the introduction of rats worldwide. So it's moved around the world with Norway and roof rats. And then this is the flea that, if you're bitten, um, can infect you and transmit disease if it happens to be carrying it. So one of the main things that we're looking at in our district, because as I mentioned, um, we deal with a tremendous amount of rodent calls in our district, is a problem that we're having with Norway rats um, in the county. So they're in a host of different areas in the county. Um, and their populations in some areas are getting worse. And that's due to a lot of to the homeless encampment situation, which I'll talk about in a minute, but to familiarize you with Norway rats, um, they're commonly known as the sewer rat or the brown rat, and they were introduced from China, and they are now a worldwide pest species. And they're commonly associated with humans um, in highly urbanized environments. So for those of you who are not super familiar and don't have to deal with Norway rats, you predominantly find them in areas where like in Oakland, like in the sewer system. And generally, if the infrastructure is fine and there's no issues, they'll stay there. They'll stay in the sewer systems um, and that's where they live. The problem is, is what, when there's a break in that infrastructure, like a sewer lateral goes down, those rats will then come out of the sewer system and then come up above ground and then they don't go back. So the way I explain it to people is that, you know, no offense to anyone who grew up like in Kansas or anything, but if you were living in Kansas and then you got dumped in Hawaii, the chances of you going back underground and like, you know, willingly leaving if you're just hanging out, it's probably slim to none. So because I, I get asked all the time, they're like, well, don't the rats go back underground? No. <laughs> 
once they're out, they're out. Um, so then that becomes a problem because they're tremendously good burrowers and swimmers. And so if the populations are left unchecked, what happens is, is that they can cause a huge amount of infrastructure damage. They can undermine foundations, sidewalks, um, you know, levee systems, you name it. And they are also a host to a number of active parasites, as I mentioned. So not only fleas, but lice and mites as well. So as I mentioned, this is a huge problem for us um, in dealing with our homeless encampments. So for those of you who don't live in Alameda County or around the Bay Area, but it's a problem statewide, but particularly for us is that we have a, a large number of homeless encampments in our cities. Um, and the power of the problem is, is that there's a tremendous amount of food that's left out. So there's a constant food supply and there's a constant amount of harborage. So the problem is, is that people and they're well-meaning bring food out for the residents of the encampments, but the problem is, is that there's no refrigeration. So if that food isn't eaten at the end of the night, it's left out. And then that basically just becomes food for the rats. And then that cycle just continues. And there's an inordinate amount of harborage. So these are all photos that I took at various encampments that we work at. And, um, you know, as you can see from that last picture, you know, trying to find rats in that is a whole different ball game, you know, than trying to find with rats and deal with rats in and around structures. And so we decided that we needed to get ahead of this issue and start doing disease surveillance before there, we didn't want to be on the back end in case something happened because we knew that we probably had the same disease cycles going in Alameda County. And as I said, a lot of the problem is the amount of food that gets brought to these encampments. So these are pictures that I've taken um, over the last few years at the various encampments. And that last picture is of one of my colleagues, Augustine, and we got out there to do some surveillance and somebody, you know, meant well, but basically had left an entire like Mexican buffet for like 25 people and dropped it off at this encampment for these residents, which is great, but this was like three o'clock in the afternoon already. So if that food wasn't eaten in the next several hours, it just sits out all night and then becomes food for the rats and then therefore causes more problems. So this is a map um, of the city of Oakland with some of the homeless encampments mapped out. And I don't have a more updated map to show you, but even if I did, it would basically be out of date by the minute it was made. So we have encampments all over the city. Um, some of you may have heard about our worst encampment, Wood Street, um, which has been ongoing for years and is a huge encampment. But these encampments move, they change. Um, but we're dealing with uh, and we trap in basically the larger encampments in the city because the thing is, is that as the people stay there longer, the amount of harborage builds up and the amount of food builds up. And then that's what starts bringing in the rats and then the rats start breeding. So our trapping protocol for doing um, our surveillance in the encampments is um, we put out uh, 20 to 30 live traps um, in the afternoon. Oh. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that. It says somebody else is in control of my screen, which I don't know how that happened because I didn't touch anything. I think it was probably an accident. Right now, I don't see anything. Are you able to maybe reshare? Yeah, let me try to. Okay. Okay. I see it, but it's at the beginning. Yeah, and let's see if I can, if it's going to let me, sorry. Sorry, everyone, as I rapidly click through this. <laughs> that would be a good refresher for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> you covered a lot of faster. Yeah. So. There doesn't seem to be a faster way for me to, it doesn't, it's not letting me access all of my slides at once. So um, apologies, but one second. Okay, so um, this is a, um, as I was mentioning, so our trapping protocol in the camps is we set out live traps um, in the afternoon and then we bait them with a combination of mackerel and peanut butter because we found that that was the most effective bait to use in the encampments because we're fighting with the problem of all of those other food resources that are left out that the rats are used to eating. So the combination of the mackerel and the peanut butter seems to be really effective because the mackerel is really smelly and oily and very fatty and the rats seem to like it. So that's what we use. Um, we look for activity, um, signs of activity when we're setting those traps out. 
So we're looking for like droppings left out, um, paw prints, signs of active burrowing, as you can see here, where the um, they're actually digging out the dirt. And then we place those traps in and around the homeless encampment. And this is a picture of one of um, our staff placing out some of those traps. And what we do is then we then cover those traps with articles of clothing or bedding or whatnot that we found in the encampment. Um, because rats are very neophobic, meaning that they're fearful of anything new in their environment. So what we found is that covering them over um, with fabric from the encampment, which smells like the encampment, reduces that neophobic neophobicism. I don't know if that's a word um, for the rats, and then helps them to not identify it as something new in the encampment. And they're more likely to go to the traps and to the bait. So the traps are left out overnight, and then we pick them up the next morning, and then the rats are brought back to our lab and then euthanized. And then we spray them down with a pyrethroid to kill any of the ectoparasites that happen to be on those animals. And then we let them sit for at least an hour, usually overnight or longer, and we put them generally at this point in the freezer to make sure that any of those ectoparasites are dead before our staff process them. So we process the fleas by getting them off those animals. And so we actually comb the fleas um, from the animals as well as collecting the other ectoparasites. And then we identify those fleas to species and then we pull them for PCR testing. So we disinfect the fleas at that point and we wash them in ethanol and sterile water. And then we run PCR on them. So this is a picture of one of my staff, Natalia, who do, does um, our molecular work. And then so she homogenizes those fleas and then she runs the extraction our, on our Kingfisher duo and then does a real time PCR assay. So you guys don't have to like memorize that or anything, but that's just the protocol that we use for running it on our quant five. So this is a picture um, of our data from the last two years. And so the red that you see in this map, and this was, map was done by one of our staff, Stephanie, who does all our amaz amazing GIS map work. Um, and so basically what the red is, is that the urban density centers in the county. Um, so as you can see, obviously like along the coast, running through Oakland and down to the south. And then those pockets of red in the middle are like Dublin and Pleasanton and Livermore. And so the green triangles are the places where we've gotten rickettsial positive fleas um, from 2021. And then the yellow boxes are areas where we've gotten positive fleas from 2022. And as you can see, which makes sense because Norway rats, um, and this is where this batch of fleas is coming from, um, are highly concentrated in urbanized areas because of human infrastructure. And so that's where we're picking up these fleas that we're testing for disease. So as I mentioned though, we also do a tremendous amount of wildlife work. And if we do end up having to trap those animals out because they've caused damage to um, property or whatnot, um, we do use those animals for scientific purposes. So we do euthanize them in accordance with the American Veterinary Association guidelines, and then we bring those animals back and then we um, euthanize them and then we also comb them for fleas. So this is some of our data um, of rickettsial species that we've confirmed to date from fleas that we've recovered from wildlife within the county. And so far we've found three different rickettsial species that are associated with fleas um, from opossums in Alameda County. Rickettsia felis being one of them. We also picked up Rickettsia felis positive fleas from raccoons and then also fleas from skunks. But we also picked them up from other species besides the rats that you wouldn't think of. We picked them up from feral cats, confirming that we do have that disease transmission cycle in the county, but we've picked them up from gray foxes as well as feral pigs. So as a reminder, you know, we do deal with other wildlife that most vector control districts don't deal with in the county. So when um, Dave Hammett, our wild, USDA wildlife trapper, went out and did work, we managed to get fleas off of those feral pigs that he was dealing with. So we do also look for some other diseases that are associated with the rats and the homeless encampments. And this is just a list of some of the other diseases that are associated with. We are currently um, doing surveillance for sole virus as well as leptospirosis in the county. And then again, the marine typhus and fleaborne typhus. So I'm hoping to expand our lab capability where we will be testing for Bartonella um, from lice actually that we pull off the rats um, in the future, but we're not quite there yet. So for the sole virus and the leptospirosis testing, um, we actually take blood samples from those rats that we bring back from the field. 
And then we separate the blood and the sera, and then we test it via ELISA. So for those of you who are not familiar, basically what that means is it's kind of like a COVID test that everybody's more familiar with these days, where um, you're looking for the presence of the antigen. So it's like you've been exposed to this disease, and then you're looking for the presence of it when you're doing those tests. So what you're looking at there in that panel with all of the color change dots is that that is the ones that are dark are the positive samples, meaning that we have detected the presence of that pathogen. So that's how we conduct our uh, disease surveillance for those two pathogens in the county. So switching gears now, I'm going to talk about Lyme disease um, and ticks, which most people are familiar with. Um, and this came about actually in 1975 um, from an unusual outbreak of juvenile arthritis um, in Lyme, Connecticut. So Lyme disease is caused by a spirochete called, uh, named Borrelia burgdorferi, and all spirochete is is just a type of bacteria. So as scientists, we're not always the most like, you know, clever people in the world. It's called a spirochete because it's spiral in shape. That's it. <laughs> but that's the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. Um, and it's normally found associated with not all animals, but specifically certain types of mice and wood rats. Um, and those are the main hosts um, that we worry about in this area that carry Lyme disease. And then that disease can, is then transmitted to humans through the bite of a tick. And this is the tick that we're looking for, and that's Exodes pacificus specifically. So in Alameda County, we have the Western black-legged tick, or Exodes pacificus, and that is the only known vector that we have of Lyme disease within Alameda County. Um, I put this slide up because I don't want it to be confused with the Eastern black-legged tick, which for those of you who grew up or are familiar with like the Northeast um, area, you know, like past the Rockies going, that's a huge area for Lyme disease. And part of that is because of the fact that there's such a large deer population over there. So we don't have that in the West. We have the Western version. We have the Western black-legged tick. So this is what um, Exodes specificus looks like. So that's a female there and she's very distinctive. So she's got a red abdomen and a black scutum. So that's just the top half of the body and then a bright red abdomen. Um, the males are not so distinctive in color or um, design, if you want to put it that way, where they basically, they can come in a variety of different colors. So you see a light one there versus a dark one. Um, and you can see that they have, you know, a much more modeled coloration. So the thing to be aware of is that it's not only the adults, but it's also the younger stages, um, nymphal and larval stages, that can transmit disease. So ticks are not actually insects. Um, insects have six legs, ticks have eight. So these are arachnids, um, and what, but they do have similar life stages. And the thing is, is that actually the nymphal stage is, has a higher prevalence of Lyme disease naturally than the adults. And so where the disease transmission occurs is because they're the size of a poppy seed. And most people don't know what they are. They don't know how to look for them. So a lot of people don't even realize that they've been bitten. The adult tick is easier to see, as the diagram shows, because it's more the size of a sesame seed. So if you see it on your body, you're more likely to realize that it's there and then remove it before any disease transmission can occur. So what is the disease cycle for Lyme disease? So normally, if humans weren't involved, um, there would be reservoirs of rodents um, out in the wild um, that the ticks, the young ticks, larval, nymphal ticks, would be feeding on. And then as they grow, it would just kind of continue. They would then, the larger adult ticks would be feeding on deer and other larger hosts, and that would be the end of it. But because humans like to go out into the same areas, as I do since I'm an avid hiker, you know, you're out in areas that have ticks, and that's when people pick them up. Um, or, you know, if you take your dog out on the trail and stuff, and, you know, any dog owner who does that, you know, when you come home, you're taking ticks off of your dog, all those things. Um, and that leads the to the disease transmission cycle. So what are the early symptoms of Lyme disease if you do get bitten? So the most common symptoms are fatigue, chills, fever, headache, muscle, and joint ache. The issue is, is that that pretty much is the same disease symptoms as like 4,000 other diseases. So it's not super helpful just based on that. There is something that is telltale for Lyme disease specifically, and that's what's called the bullseye rash or the arrhythmia migrants, excuse me. Um, and this is very telltale and is only for Lyme disease. And it's called a bullseye rash because it literally looks like a bullseye. And that's from an area where the tick bite occurred. 
So the thing is, though, is that not everyone develops this very like classical bullseye rash. It can look different in different people. So it can actually kind of come up as red blotches um, on people. So this is a picture of someone where that was the case. Um, so as the spirochetes um, multiply in the body, they then move and then they develop these patches instead. And over the next few weeks, it can continue to go. So this is a picture of a young girl who had a tick bite. And as you can see, that red line down her face is an indication because she did pick up Lyme disease at that point, but that's not the classical bullseye. So the thing to be aware of is just, if you're out in areas that have ticks and you start developing any of these symptoms, you need to go to the doctor immediately and then tell them that you've been in an area and you may have been exposed to a tick-borne pathogen and then they need to do some testing. Because the problem, especially with Lyme disease, if it's left untreated, is that it can cause a host of neurological issues. One of them is Bell's palsy, which is this diagram shows here, um, as well as a whole other host of neurological problems, um, in including like stiff necks, dizziness. And that's a picture of a young patient who ended up getting Bell's palsy. Um, from being untreated. So the thing is, is that, you know, you go to the doctor if you develop any of these symptoms and then let them know that you've been in an area that, and you may have been exposed to tick bites. Um, because if not, you know, it does develop into a host of other uh, more severe problems as time goes along. And the thing is, is that this can occur, unfortunately, months or years after the initial infection. So this is a map from the California Department of Public Health um, in terms of Lyme disease risk in the state of California. So the darker areas are where you would kind of expect because it's more forested, it's still un not as urbanized, amazingly enough, in the state. Um, and those are the northern counties. So like where Eureka is and everything, you have the highest prevalence of picking up a tick that has Lyme disease. So there's a very low prevalence of it in Alameda County. So our ticks historically, are less than 5% of an infection rate of Lyme disease. But it is something because it's here and we know it's here and we want the public to be safe that we still monitor for it on a yearly basis. The other ticks that we look for that we have in Alameda County besides Ixodes specificus are Dermacenter occidentalis and Dermacenter variabilis. And the reason that we also monitor for them is because they are also vectors of other tick-borne diseases. So. Both species are vectors of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and specifically Dermacenter occidentalis can also vector Pacific Coast tick fever. And we have had a couple of cases of those around the Bay Area in the last few years. So we're actually gonna start hopefully testing for Pacific Coast tick fever as well in Alameda County, but currently we are, um, as we're expanding our tick-borne pathogen program, um, that's what we're looking on. So as uh, my staff go out and they do tick surveillance around the county, we bring back these ticks and then we test them. So where do you find adult ticks? Um, you'll find them out in the wilderness, basically. So you're not going to find them in like downtown San Francisco and downtown Oakland. They need to be in more um, rural settings, such as like uh, forests and grassland areas. So normally you will find them, especially the adults, on the edge of the grass doing what is called questing. So that's what that picture is of that female. And she's got her arms out like this, and that's what they do. So they sit on the edge of a blade of grass and they wait for a host to come by. There's no distinction for them between you and a deer. They don't know the difference. They just know that something warm went by and you're a potential blood meal. And that's when they latch on to you. So you will also find more ticks on the upside of trails. Um, and as I said, and they're found in like forested, wooded, you know, rural areas. So you're not going to find them in a highly urbanized environment. Where do you find nymphal ticks? As a reminder, nymphal ticks are very, very small. So they literally are the size of poppy seeds. And then they tend to congregate on areas such as leaf litter, um, oak leaf litter in particular, um, on logs and tree trunks. And that's a picture of somebody who's got the different life stages of the tick all on their fingertips. So this is just a reminder that these guys are very small and you need to be aware of them if you're out in the environment. So how do you protect yourself from tick bites? Um, Recommendation is to wear light color clothing so that if you do see them, that gives you the ability to see them on your body when you come in off the trail. Um, walk in the center of the trail. Don't go off exploring through the grass and through the brush, if you, especially in an area that you don't know if there are ticks or not. DEET is your best friend if you're out going into the wilderness and to hiking, um, as well as permethrin-treated clothing. So that's an insecticide that 
is meant to be applied to clothing, not to skin. But the cool thing about it is that it actually lasts for several washes. So you can get, you can do it yourself. You can get Promethrin and spray your clothing. And then it'll be good for like 15 washes before you have to retreat it. But, and then that insecticidal um, barrier works when you're out in the field. And then you want to do what we call a tick check when you come back in. So you want to have, you know, if you're with someone, ask them to double check that they don't see anything, you know, on your clothing, on your back. But, you know, take your stuff off, wash it, and then just check yourself for ticks when you come in off of the field. So as a review, um, Ixodes specificus, or the Western Black-Legged Tick, is the only vector of Lyme disease in Alameda County. Nymphal ticks are usually the life stage that transmits the disease, so the little tiny ones, um, but we do have a low infection rate in Alameda County. So our ticks are usually running at 5% or less infection rate, and then our adults are generally at about 1% to 2%. If you do develop a bullseye rash or any other kind of neurological issues and you've been in an area that has ticks, please go to your doctor and let them know that you may need to be tested. So um, as I mentioned, we're expanding our tick surveillance program. So we're now also looking at anaplasmosis um, at our ticks in the county um, because we've had an increase in cases um, Bay Area wide over the last year or two. Um, unfortunately, the symptoms for the disease are very much the same as you would get for Lyme disease and some other tick-borne diseases. So again, if you're out in these areas and you think you've been in contact with them, you know, this is a, a diagram that's been put together by the California Department of Public Health that you can pull off offline that shows you what tick-borne pathogens are in California, which ticks are vectoring them, and then the case rates in areas that you would find them. So I just put that up there so people can pull it off as a reference um, if they want to from the CDPH website. So switching gears to another pathogen, we're going to talk about hantavirus now, and this is related to uh, mice that we have in the county. So hantavirus um, was discovered in the Four Corners region of the U.S. Um, if you haven't been there, it's really cool. Literally all four corners of the state come together and you can stand there and have, you know, your foot in two states at the same time. Um, but what happened is, is that a bunch of young, healthy individuals became ill suddenly and then half of them died. And so what researchers discovered is that it was probably transmitted by rodents and then specifically by deer mice. So it was named Sonombi virus and then uh, a new class disease of viruses um, or pathogens called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. So what is hantavirus? It is rare, first off. Um, but how do you contract it? So your exposure has to be with an area where you have these rodents that are actually carrying hantavirus. So if you go into an area where you end up breathing in a lot of aerosolized dust from rodent feces or urine that's come out of their bedding or areas that they've been running, you've touched an infected area and then you end up touching your eye or your nose, um, and then the bite of an infected rodent is also another way that you can become infected. So the way that we survey for it in Alameda County is we put out live traps um, called Sherman traps, and we're specifically looking for that little guy there down in the bottom of the trap, which is a deer mouse. Um, and these mice are not found in highly urbanized areas. So again, you're not going to find them in downtown San Francisco. We don't find them in downtown Oakland. Where we do find them is in the hills um, and the more rural suburban interface areas. So we do a lot of surveillance in the East Bay Regional Park Districts. Um, in the parks that are in our county within the system. Um, and then those areas of the county where we do have that area where the housing or buildings are pushing up against rural land, that's where we target our surveillance. So specifically, we're looking for um, deer mice. So Paramiscus maniculatus is one of the species that we're looking for. Um, and they are about the size of a house mouse, but not to be confused with a house mouse. They're a completely different species. So they are abundant across North America, but they're not found in the Southeast, and they're found in a range of habitats. But as I mentioned, it's mostly what we call peridomestic. So when you hear about hantavirus cases, it's generally in areas like in Lake Tahoe, where somebody hasn't used their cabin in a year or two, they've gone up, they're like cleaning it out. And what they don't realize is that this particular species of mice has gotten in has been running around, they kick up the urine and the feces and air slice it and then breathe it in and then that's how they come down with hantavirus. So this is just a uh, schematic showing you the difference in what a house mouse looks like versus a deer mouse. And house mice are small as are deer mice, but their coloration is very different. 
Um, so house mice are generally one color all the way along. Um, and deer mice are different, they're two-tone. So their bellies are white. And they also have larger eyes and ears. Um, so that's a really big distinction between house mice and deer mice, as well as the habitat that they're living in. And rats do not carry hantavirus. So we have people that call in that are worried because they've got a rodent issue in their home. They want to know hantavirus is an issue and no. So Norway rats and roof rats and house mice do not transmit hantavirus. Again, we are specifically looking for deer mice that have larger eyes. They have larger ears. They also have it underneath the tail. Their tail is two-toned. So they have a white stripe running underneath the underside of their tail. And then they have a white belly. So the clinical manifestations of hantavirus, um, the early symptoms, again, are kind of like a lot of other things, you know, where you think you may have a fever or whatnot, or, you know, you're coming down with the flu. Um, but the problem is, is that the later symptoms of hantavirus are very different. So you start having shortness of breath is because your lungs are beginning to fill with fluid, so you can't get that oxygen intake. And this usually happens four to 10 days after exposure. So again, if you think that you're, and that's just a radiograph of someone who's got fluid in their lungs and is having problems breathing. So if you, how to get it diagnosed is that it's sort of hard actually to get it diagnosed in the first few days after you've been exposed. But if you do start having weird reactions or you think that something's going on, you need to go to your doctor immediately. And again, tell them that you've been in an area where you believe you've been with deer mice. You need to get tested and checked out because you have a history of rodent exposure. Okay. And the reason that that's so important is because there's no specific treatment or cure for hantavirus. Basically, they have to treat the symptoms and they have to be able to get you on oxygen as soon as possible because of the issue of your lungs starting to fill with fluid. So the earlier that that treatment can be started, um, the better your prognosis is for um, overcoming it. So switching gears again now to other pathogens. Um, so now we're talking about mosquito related ones. So specifically, we're talking about arboviruses. And all that means is that basically it's an arthropod borne virus. And so that means that an arthropod has to is involved in the transmission of that virus um, to a human. And so there, and not all mosquitoes carry West Nile. Spe so specifically, we are talking about the sub, the genus of mosquitoes called Culex. And, but we do have those mosquitoes in and around the Bay Area. They're normally here, they're our native species. And so along with West Nile virus, they also transmit St. Louis encephalitis, as well as Eastern equine encephalitis. And there are several species of Culex mosquitoes that can transmit West Nile virus. The main ones that we are concerned with um, in Alameda County and, and in the Bay Area is the Western Encephalitis Mosquito or Culex tarsalis and the Northern House Mosquito or Culex pipiens. So West Nile virus was first detected in California in 2003 and is now found statewide. So this is the transmission cycle for West Nile virus. So Culex mosquitoes are predominantly bird feeders. And as the diagram shows, some of their favorite uh, birds that they like to take meals off of and that are susceptible to West Nile virus are corvids. So that means ravens and crows, um, blue jays, stellar jays, um, as well as songbirds such as finches. And then when it becomes a problem is when those mosquitoes then deviate and then they take a blood meal from a human or a horse because it can be fatal um, to those, to horses as well as to people. So Culex mosquitoes, as I mentioned, predominantly feed on different birds, but these birds are some of the most susceptible. So if you're out somewhere and you happen to see a dead scrub jay or a crow or a raven, you can send them off to be tested. So these animals are in the family Corvidae and they are unfortunately more susceptible than other groups of birds in terms of West Nile virus. So if you do find any of those dead birds, um, you can call your local vector control district and you can also call the West, the, uh, West Nile virus dead bird hotline. And then they can walk you through getting that bird picked up so that it can be tested for West Nile virus. So that is, if there is an issue with the mosquitoes in, those, in that area, it can be dealt with. So the other one that we've been dealing with quite a lot, um, unfortunately, and some of you may have heard about is avian influenza. So that is, um, what it does is it affects uh, commercial chicken flocks 
Um, and when it does, it becomes under the jurisdiction of the California Department of Food and Ag. So it is a disease, it's a viral disease that's normally um, out in the environment and it's normally associated with waterfowl and shorebirds. However, the issue is with those birds dying, that's under the jurisdiction of US Fish and Wildlife, USDA and California Fish and Wildlife. And avian influenza is now statewide. So this is a current map from uh, CDFA of all of the counties in California that are experiencing issues with avian influenza. And so as I mentioned, it's normally there in the environment. It doesn't do a whole lot of damage, but right now we're having an outbreak that's nationwide. So we've got a lot of birds that are becoming sick and then going down with avian influenza. And so in Alameda County, we're helping along in conjunction with the USDA and California Fish and Wildlife to monitor for the presence of the disease in the county. And then we're hoping that as this cycle slows down, um, the number of birds that we're seeing die off from it will slow down as well. The issue becomes is that it is transmitted from bird to bird. There does not seem to be any um, issue with humans at this point. There's not a risk of human transmission, but this is strictly a zoonotic disease. So this is an issue though with birds. So we're asking people right now who have bird feeders out, even though I'm also a birder and I love birds, to not have those bird feeders out right now because what it's doing is it's causing increased transmission um, in the environment of the disease. And so if people can take their bird feeders down, your birds will do okay. They'll learn to go back and feed where they were feeding before you put your feeder up. Um, but you will also decrease that risk of disease transmission between those birds. Because as I mentioned, the issue with it is that it's causing massive die-offs with domesticated poultry. So backyard flocks as well as commercial flocks, if they become infected, they have to be culled. Um, and that's the big issue with it at the moment. And so that's a map from the USDA of all of the states um, where we're having hits with avian influenza. So it's, it's all across the US. So for those of you who are like, and hadn't heard what the heck happened with the prices of eggs, and the fact that they doubled and tripled in some areas, it's because due to the fact that all of these commercial flocks that then tested positive for avian influenza had to be called and put down so that we can try to stay ahead um, of the disease so that it doesn't keep spreading. So just to kind of wrap up, um, and sorry if I went a little bit fast, <laughs> but um, Raccoon roundworm, we're hoping to start doing some surveillance um, in the county regarding that. Um, we're also hoping to resume doing plague surveillance in the county. Um, Alameda County does have a historical presence of plague in the county, and we no one has done surveillance in the county for over 40 years, unfortunately. So we're actually hoping to start that up this summer, um, trying to get the flea um, and the host tested for the presence of plague just to see if we have an issue with it still in the county. As I mentioned, we're hoping to increase the diseases that we're testing for with ticks. So that includes uh, expanding our disease surveillance to include uh, Pacific Coast tick fever as well as Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We do have another bird disease that's going through the county right now um, and is in multiple counties and that's avian trichomoniasis. So um, and it's specifically hitting a native species of pigeon called the bantail pigeon, and that's what the bird looks like. So not to be confused with pigeon pigeons, which we're all familiar with, which I know some people, myself included, call flying rats sometimes, not to be confused with those. <laughs> this is a native bird, um, and they're more purple in color, and they're bigger than um, your, native, your normal pigeon that you would see like in and around the financial district. Um, and so what's happening is that these birds, they're developed because of the disease, they're developing um, ulcers um, in and around their eyes and then also in, in their digestive tracts. And so they're not able to eat. And so that's what's causing the birds to die. So we're having an issue with it going through bantel pigeons right now. So if you are having that and you're seeing that in your area, then you need to contact uh, California Fish and Wildlife because they're trying to do their best to monitor as the disease moves. Um, through the state, where it's going and what's going on. Um, the other program that I wanted to mention um, that we've been doing for years since our district was founded is we do do also rabies surveillance. So if uh, a homeowner or a business ends up getting a bat um, in there and they don't know what to do, they can call us. Our staff will go out and remove the bat from that location. Um, and if there's any chance of human contact, then we take that bat in and that bat is tested by 
um, our public health department um, for the potential of having rabies. And if it does, then we work in that area and then we put flyers out, you know, we alert the residents in that area that we did pick up an animal that ha has been positive for rabies and that they need to take precautions and whatnot. So with that, and I guess, sorry if I did that a little bit fast, um, but <laughs> I'd like to thank um, my boss, um, the chief of our vector control district, uh, Robert Gay. Um, I co-manage, so I manage more of the scientific side, and then our other manager, Bruce Kirkpatrick, uh, manages kind of more of our, our operations side of things. Um, my vector ecologist, Wade Lee, um, and then one of our biologists who did a lot of work with helping with the rodent trapping and the homeless encampments, um, Augustine Tavia, um, Natalie Federova, who does all of my molecular testing, and then all of my staff um, at Alameda County Vector Control, who are awesome and go out and do our tick surveillance as well as our other surveillance. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Adina. That uh, presentation was packed with such great information. It's really impressive work. Um, yeah, I see some folks uh, giving you some virtual applause. I will do the same.